Oh, well, we'll get what we can. Transportation, housing and urban development, health and human services, and agriculture. And I, you know, I want to encourage you all, if you have good projects, to apply. We will probably be putting out the notice where we announce that the funds are available and how you apply sometime late January, early February. And, and you know, applications will come in a few months after that. And the DOT staff, we are available to provide any technical assistance, talk to you if you have any questions, help you with an application if you want to apply. But that is particularly now, you know, one of the few programs in the transportation field that's out there where counties can come directly and apply for funds. And we really encourage you to do so. Relationship, and in many ways, we'd like to have you back. You can. Um, prior to uh, joining Pennsylvania's uh, Department of Public Welfare, she um, worked for this, did extensive work for the city of Philadelphia. Within the city of Philadelphia, she uh, was the deputy commissioner for MHMR. She was the Commissioner of Public Health, she was the Director of Social Services, and ultimately she was the Managing Director for the city. But, so I think, you see, with that kind of a background, uh, she very clearly knows what we are all about, uh, and although she's just uh, getting to know all of you, I think within a very short time she's going to be uh, a close friend of NACO, and it's going to be a very wonderful, productive relationship. So, enjoy the safe words. See the impact the CVPG makes, whether it's creating jobs, helping um, bring businesses into their community, forge innovative partnerships around child care. CVGB is a critical tool for counties across America. Every time I read in the federal budget they were um, cutting or, or moving towards cutting, CVPG got cringe because I could count the number of, of cities, of towns, of families, of, of consumers that were going to be directly impacted by that. And for a while, when the state had money, we could backfill. But then there came a point that there was just no way for, for states and counties to backfill, and then we had to deal with the reality of the cuts. And while the recent budget agreement did show a commitment to CDBG, like all of you, I know the cuts in it were painful, and even more so for many of you given congressionally mandated formula changes and the Congress's decision to carve out up to $300 million in disaster assistance from the CDBG program overall. We're still trying to get a clarification on how that actually is going to work. It's a pleasure and an honor to spend a few minutes with you here today. Dr. Cole. Awarded fashion patients at the center raises quality and decreases cost. If so, we want to hear about it. That's what our uh, Innovation Center at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, is asking for. And that highlights the theme of better care. For better insurance so that we can get better care, uh, we want to make sure that the themes of accessibility and affordability are stressed in a number of ways. So on the day the President signed this new bill into law, the insurance companies can no longer deny kids coverage simply because they're sick, simply because they have a pre-existing condition. And by 2014, that same provision will apply to adults. And also, it used to be, as I mentioned already, and many of you know, we have lots of families who can go bankrupt trying to keep up with medical costs because insurance companies have put so-called uh, lifetime limits on coverage. Uh, one that, uh, as a an Iowa native that I would be uh, asked to uh, to uh, introduce. Um, uh, this afternoon, uh, first of all, I want to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Merrigan knows and uh, Secretary Vilsack know that uh, 
the National Association of Counties and uh, county state associations and officials across the nation appreciate the great working relationship that we've uh, been able to develop with you over the years. So I wanted to get that out there right away because uh, that's critical and uh, you know I have a sort of a bad memory so I was a things that USDA does because of that struggle is we provide nutrition assistance. I see the talking heads on the Sunday morning shows. I uh, admittedly I'm addicted to those shows. My kids call me the big family nerd. Um, but I hear these people talk about how we're going to solve the budget crisis and we're going to cut back on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and farm subsidies. And I think of that little ditty from Sesame Street. You know, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just isn't the same. Because farm subsidies is actually a really small thing compared to those other entitlement programs. And when you look at USDA's budget, nearly 75% of it is nutrition assistance programs. We now have over 46 million people on the SNAP program, formerly known as food stamps. And between all of our nutrition programs, including our school lunch and breakfast programs, those offices where there was another FSA office, Farm Service Agency, within 20 miles, and the office had two or fewer people, take a look at those first as potential offices to close. And so on Monday, he announced 131 of those offices would be closing. Consolidating. I mean, that's not far leaving farmers and ranchers in the lurch. And all USDA full-time permanent employees will be offered options to a USDA employment elsewhere. In the happy cases, it might be 20 miles away at the next office. In the more unhappy places, uh, it might even have to be a state away. But um, how many offices? You say 259 offices? That sounds like an awful lot of offices. But my retort, I come back, give the example specific to the Farm Services Agency. 131, that was the bulk of the offices, but that still leaves us with more than 2,100 offices across the United States. So we programs. The economists named him one of the minds of the moment. He likes graphs, appendix tables, <laughs> lives in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming Ezra McClain. One sentence on it. There will be one sentence of punditry. And it is the only sentence you need to hear on South Carolina. And here it is. I have a window. I just need to find it on my page. Um, one of two things will happen in South Carolina. Either Mitt Romney will win the South Carolina primary and go on to win the nomination, or Mitt Romney will lose the South Carolina primary and go on to win the nomination. <laughs> President Barack Obama and Mitt Romney uh, are two credible, decent seeming guys. They are both uh, legitimate candidates for the presidency, except for Barack Obama being born in uh, Kenya. And, uh, <laughs> and as such, they are both going to run incredibly effective campaigns. And I, I, people need to think hard when they do campaign coverage of what that actually means. These two campaigns will have very little difference in how effective they are in messaging. They will not make gigantic mistakes. They will not be able to get their supporters to the polls. And they are going to give each and every voter more than enough excuses to vote for their candidate and against the other guy. 